Great. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel Stancliffe, and um, I'm the director of the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So welcome to the launch of our report on the value of NHS green space for staff and well-being, space to breathe. Just to let you know that we're recording this event, uh, we'll also be making presentations available um, afterwards on our website. So um, don't worry about taking notes, just uh, enjoy. Um, so the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare is a charity working to make healthcare more sustainable for the past 12 years. Um, and alongside our work engaging with the health sector, we've also um, done uh, focused quite a lot on the importance of green space for health, both in clinical settings and in communities. Um, and this event explores the value of NHS green space, specifically for staff wellbeing. We'll be sharing our research, which was supported by the Health Foundation, and hearing from some of the wonderful people at the hospitals um, that were involved in that research. The detailed reports are all available on the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare website, and we'll put a link to that web page in the chat. We'll be taking questions after we've heard from each of the speakers. So if you do have thoughts or questions, please put them in the chat uh, and Andrea will feed them in. So we've got a lot to pack in today. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome first Louise Pramas. She's the Transformation Lead for Staff Experience and Engagement in the Digital Directorate at NHS England and NHS Improvement. So Louise, over to you. Excellent, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you for, um, for joining us this morning. Um, my name, uh, as, as Rachel said, I'm, I'm Louise Premis. Um, I'm one of the new transformation leads at NHS England and NHS Improvement. But before joining the Culture Transformation team, um, there I was also the lead for the National Improving Health and Wellbeing Programme. Um, and so the two beautifully meld uh, for our discussion today. So I just wanted to kind of give you a bit of an overview um, in the first instance um, around um, you know, how, why this is a national priority. And of course, um, for those of you who have been working in the health and wellbeing space for some time, you'll be very familiar with a whole range of um, history of rich guidance and advice that's been published over the years, um, really making the case for focusing on health and wellbeing um, of our colleagues in, in the workplace and how good work contributes to good health. So if you like a little bit of reading and you haven't come across these yet, um, the slides will be available afterwards and I would really recommend um, having a read of, of, of these papers. Um, but the upshot is really the case has been made for some time, uh, for a long time really, uh, on focusing on health and well-being. Um, sometimes it takes uh, the, the kind of focus of so the outcome measures, thinking about things like sickness absence rates, but also some, um, but really we should be thinking about it in terms of those broader impacts. So looking at recruitment, attraction, retention, they all connect to health and well-being, as well as organisational cultures, um, and particularly around productivity. And for us in the NHS, of course, that's a care experience. Um, and and equally, you know, there is a productivity gain as well to be made there. So for every pound spent, so Keith Pearson identified that um, there's a return on investment of £4.20. Um, you know, so, so from a range of angles, um, the case is made really for focusing and, and investing in the health and well-being of our NHS people. Add into that our current context, um, and obviously, you know, COVID-19 has really brought the health and well-being of our people into sharp focus. But the point I'd really like to make is really... Um, health and well-being is for life, it's not just for COVID. Um, so those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, this is the, the rainbow here we have is the People Promise. Um, and, and this is sort of a summary of the People Plan that was published earlier this year uh, in the summer. And the People Plan really sets the vision for the NHS and how it ought to feel to work in the NHS. Um, and of course, that all speaks to organisational culture. Um, but each of these aspects of the people promise all touch on um, health and well-being and organisational culture. So creating a compassionate and inclusive working environment, for example, is an organisational culture change shift in some places. Um, but also working in an environment 
where you are included, you are able to be your whole self, you're able to thrive in your workplace in a compassionate environment that's care caring for you, contributes to your health and well-being. Equally being recognised for the work that you do and rewarded for that has an impact on your health and well-being. Being able to have an element of control in your work and having a voice that counts being heard. Again, you know, we, we've, we've had um, freedom to speak up um, week, month, um, sorry, time period recently, um, or we might be in it still, apologies, um, I'm, I'm getting my dates muddled up, but um, that freedom to speak up part, shifting towards creating that environment where people feel able to raise their concerns, know that they'll be heard and listened to and treated with dignity and respect in that, that is a, that is a health and wellbeing intervention, as well as a cultural shift in intervention. Obviously, we are safe and healthy. Absolutely does what it says on the team, creating the environment where people are safe, where their health is supported. As I said earlier, good work is good for our health, but working environments where people feel threatened that have a negative impact, where perhaps they don't have the right equipment, where there's bullying, incivility, that can have a negative impact on our health. And again, all of that experience, that feeling of working in our organisation is, is effect, affects the organisational culture always learning, look, approaching health and well-being with a curious outset, learning different ways, how we support one another, listening to what one another needs. Again, health and well-being and culture hand in hand. Flexibility absolutely helps with health and well-being. And we're certainly seeing through the COVID period as well that um, we are being kind of forced to undertake a more flexible approach to how we work. Um, and we are a team. We, there is loads of evidence out there that resilience resides in teams. And so when, when times get tough and, you know, we're going through a pretty tough time right now, actually the support we get from one another in our teams is vital to enabling us to continue to thrive and helping us get through those difficult times. Um, and, and so all of this kind of hinges together. It all touches on our health and well-being. Um, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't be on here without giving a plug to the NHS Health and Wellbeing Framework. This was the key resource that, um, that we've been using on the Improving Health and Wellbeing Programme. It's an evidence-based resource that enables you to uh, diagnose your organisation, um, the health and wellbeing of your organisation and, and your interventions, um, and then provides guidance and best practice around some of the things that you can do um, to, to influence that. And it's currently undergoing a revision taking into consideration all of the learning from the two and a half years of the programme. So there will be an updated version coming out um, in the near future, but um, the stuff that's in there at the moment is pretty good. It was quite, it's quite tricky trying to do a kind of one in one out kind of system because there's so much good uh, work going on out there. But in relation to our conversation today, um, the organisation, the uh, health and wellbeing framework focuses on organisational enablers and health interventions. And typically, we we tend to go after the health interventions. They're the easier things to implement. You know, your fruit baskets, water bottles, yoga classes, that sort of thing. But actually, we know that the organisational enablers, which are essentially the organisational cultural elements, they are your base foundation for any health and wellbeing intervention you have. So. If leadership and management isn't strong, if your data and communication isn't strong and relevant to our conversation today, if healthy working environments aren't strong, then any of your health interventions are not going to have the impact that they would have had if they were strong. Um, and of course, you know, the green spaces comes into creating that healthy working environment for our, for our colleagues to work in. Um, now, I'm conscious that uh, some of our speakers later will be talking about, um, about the evidence, so I won't go into this too much. Um, but I did want to share with you some photos that I've taken through my time working in, um, in NHS trusts myself and some of the green spaces that I enjoyed because certainly they had a lasting impact and, uh, and very much reside in my memory. And, you know, I think that's part of the point, isn't it? You know, that, that working in a nice environment, those places stay with you. Um, but also we know uh, that creating those healthy working environments and having access to green spaces is absolutely an equality issue. So we know from um, an, a range of research that um, people living in the most economically deprived areas have less access to publicly available green space. 
and we know that people living in those areas um, tend to ha come, have a, a lower socioeconomic status, are often BAME people, people from the BAME communities, are often female. And you look at our um, you look at our workforce demographics and the people who are predominantly in our lower banded pay grades um, and bands tend to be from our BAME communities. So making a working environment where they have access to that green space to, because green space contributes to our health and well-being, as we will hear this morning, making it easy to access that space as part of day-to-day -day working is incredibly important. Um, and I just wanted to kind of leave you really on a bit of a summary and, and uh, an awareness plug and, and please take photos of the screen and share with your colleagues. Please feel free to tweet this um, and share on social media, etc. Um, as part of the um, national response to the national health and wellbeing response to COVID, we've put together a whole support package working with a range of partners in different organisations from Samaritans to the Money Advice Service. Um, to, to provide support for our colleagues at this time of difficulty. So um, if, you, if you want to see the whole package, they're all available on that people.nhs.uk website, um, but there are free telephone support lines and listening lines as bereavement support. Lot, uh, there are a number of resources that have been developed that are culturally sensitive. So whether that's using things, making getting access to things like uh, the Liberate app that is specifically developed for, um, for BAME communities and people of color, and with a cultural focus or the um, Filipino speaking helpline that's supported by Hospice UK. There are a load of resources that are available for free for all of our NHS people. And there is also a package of support that's available to social care colleagues as well. All of that information is on the NHS people, um, the people.nhs.uk website. Um, and again, feel free to take a photo of this because it's got a number of hyperlinks on there and um, I really encourage you to have a look at and explore. But certainly our colleagues are engaging with us in that piece of, you know, in, in accessing that support and I would encourage you to do so too. So we've had nearly 150,000 people downloading the apps that are freely available to staff. We've had about 17,000 or so people engaging with us in our webinars or watching them back afterwards. And again, you know, please share the link for today's session um, so that other colleagues can benefit from the learning too. Um, and I, you know, I, I hope that gives you a bit of a, a summary really of, and a, and a bit of a flavour for really, this is absolutely a national focus. I'm sure it's a focus in your organisations focusing on the health and wellbeing of our people. Um, please do continue the conversation online, um, certainly following the hashtags that we've got at the bottom of the screen here, hashtag caring for our people, caring for NHS people and our, NH and our NHS people. Um, we'd love to continue the conversation with you and I really hope you enjoy today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. That was fantastic. Um, great start to the launch of our study. Um, and, uh, and really good to know that the green space is in there, even if it's only one part, we'll make it bigger and we'll keep building that evidence. Great, thank you. Um, so I'd like to move now to Valerie Gladwell, who collaborated with us on the research. Um, Valerie is a researcher at the School of Sports, Rehabilitation and Exercise Science at the University of Essex. Welcome, Valerie. Okay, so um, as Rachel said, um, I'm uh, Dr. Valerie Gladwell and I work at a campus university um, in, in Essex. I'm not there currently. I'm currently working at home but normally I have a nice um, green environment that um, I'm working um, in. So I just want to kind of follow on from Louise's um, uh, presentation and just talk a little bit more about um, green space and why it's important um, and how it can be implemented within the workspace but not talking about um, the work that um, Car Kerry will um, talk about um, that we've been conducting at NHS site. So this is kind of work that I've done previous to that. So I'm hoping that you can see my next slide now. So um, normally uh, we know that green space, as, as Louise said, is conducive to improvements in well-being. And really we've been in, in nature and kind of been absorbed in nature until very recent times, you know, urbanization, living in towns, et cetera, is only a small part of our history. So we have this kind of 
most of the time an innate love of um, nature um, and we, we have lots of positive things that come out of nature. So what does it do? Kind of it evokes a very positive emotional response. That's in most people. There will be some people that don't have positive responses with nature, but we'll we'll kind of talk about the, the, the main people is that most people have quite a positive um, affiliation with nature. What this helps with is reducing our stress levels. Um, it also seems to restore our levels of tension for concentration. And then in kind of physiological and um, kind of more medical terms, it reduces our blood pressure and also has been seen to boost our immune system. So it's all kind of um, really good um, stuff that can really help with both our mental health and our physical health. In terms of, um, terms of nature, um, and helping with well-being. I kind of like to talk about the five ways to well-being. People talk about various different things, but I quite like the five ways to well-being because they're quite simple as a, as a concept. Um, and what kind of nature and green spaces allow us to do is to um, be active. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, throughout my lecture. But quite often they allow us to also take notice of things. Just looking at this picture on the on the right on my screen, you know, you'll start noticing various things. And by being in nature, it allows us to do that. It also hopefully allows us to keep learning about what might be around us as well. And, and by taking notice, we can maybe keep um, keep learning, which is really important. Nature potentially could give us the opportunity to start giving and giving back. So there is volunteering things that might happen within an, a nature thing, or it might be simply just by kind of collecting a bit of rubbish up on, on your walk. Um, and the other thing that we found in, in some of our work is that people, when they're in green spaces, tend to connect better together. They tend to talk a little bit more than they would if they were in, in a different kind of environment. So kind of nature can help with all the five ways um, to well-being. So I mentioned that I'd talk a little bit more about being active. Um, so the um, research that we've conducted since 2003 at the university was um, uh, kind of bringing together exposure to nature and physical activity. And we coined the phrase back in 2003. And what it is, is that potentially nature itself could, um, could help with um, kind of helping us experiencing um, that nature by us going out and doing exercise or physical activity within that in that space. So we go for a walk and we get the nature benefits for by going for that walk. And so all of those five ways to well-being can can kind of be brought to the front. Or the other thing is nature itself can actually shape our behaviour. So if you're um, I take the example of, of uh, a meeting room. If we all have chairs in a meeting room, we all sit down. If we have no chairs, we all have to stand up. Well, nature kind of provides that facility to enable um, physical activity to take place. So combining physical activity and nature, um, whether it's intense physical activity like running or just simply walking, it's getting us moving. And we know that that's really beneficial for our health um, as well. So obviously there is a huge challenge with workplace well-being. You know, we know that you're working in very stressful environments, mental well-being is, is suffering, physical health is, is a problem. We tend to have much less time. This decreases productivity, increases sick leave and increases the risk of, of making any kind of mistakes. So it is a big challenge. So we kind of had a look at um, various things um, and, and we kind of looked to see how nature could help with, with trying to help with our well-being. Um, one of our early studies was showing that, you know, you would talk about time there. I mentioned about time being precious. Well, five minutes of nature can actually enhance your mood and self-esteem. So just taking time out just for five minutes can be really beneficial just to enhance that that mood and self-esteem we also did an experiment where we showed um people images of nature um before we gave them a stressor and the stress was a mental arithmetic test and what we found is that when we tested their heart rate and their their responses um afterwards we found that they were um they kind of responded much better if they had been exposed to nature images before then 
rather than if they'd just been um, shown built images, so images of built environments. So we, we know that nature potentially might buffer us from the stresses that might happen later in the day. What was interesting about that experiment as well is we were testing um, blood pressure and heart rate um, during the experiment and um, ver showing various pictures, we could see a dramatic drop in people's blood pressure just as they were viewing and, and looking at the, um, the screen. The other thing, um, we did another experiment where we got people to go for a walk at lunchtime and we explored what was happening um, at nighttime in terms of their um, sleep quality and their um, their ability of their nervous system, which is really important in stress and stress control. And we noticed that if they'd taken a walk around a, um, a more natural walk at lunchtime, it was only a 20 minute walk, it improved their markers for um, autonomic control, suggesting that they might have had a more restorative sleep. The other thing is if we can get out during the day and, and expose ourselves to, to um, to the light, the natural light, we know that's really important for our circadian rhythms. And circadian rhythms are very important in terms of our well-being as well. So just exposing ourselves, um, either taking some exercise or even just five minutes of sitting within nature might help with that body clock. The other thing that we found in another study is that those who people who visit um, green space more often are more likely to meet the government recommendations for doing um, the right amount of physical activity. So we know that those two things go hand in hand. If we can get people to green spaces, they're more likely to be physically active, whether because they're choosing to be physically active or whether because the environment kind of enables them to be more physically active. And the other thing it seems to do is improves their perceived performance, um, both within um, in, in work and also increases their work engagement, which um, is really important. And Louise showed a slide of how important that is in terms of saving cost savings. So what can we do? Well, um, we did do a survey and this was the lunch break, but I appreciate that that I've put it in um, inverted commas because it's not always at lunchtime. But certainly when we did a survey, less than 48 percent of employees took um, um, out of a survey of 1000 people, 48 percent of employees took less than 30 minutes for lunch. So people are not taking the time to be able to restore themselves. And we know that that's really important um, in order to um, in, um, maintain their well-being. When we looked um, at uh, workplace and green spaces, we found that a lot of places did seem to have a reasonable amount of green space that was reasonable quality, but actually only 10% of employers actually used the green space. So this was um, in 2011. So basically, there seemed to be a great asset that might exist that was close to people's works, but actually wasn't being used. And therefore, you weren't receiving the well-being benefits of, of the aforementioned um, studies that I've talked about. So we um, did do a little um, uh, intervention. We did an eight week walking program. And what we did see that those people who walked around nature decreased their blood pressure, decreased their perceived stress and increased their perceived mental well-being. The other thing they seemed to do if they were going around green spaces rather than if we instructed them to walk around built environments, it increased their adherence. They were more likely to stay doing it, which is really important when you're talking about trying to get a sustained behavior change. That's really important. You don't want people just to do it once or twice. You want it to become part of their life. It might be because it seems to be easier. We've, we've done various other studies where walking in, in natural and um, environments seems to feel easier than walking in built environments. So with green spaces at, at work, obviously people, there, there are potential there, huge potential for increasing well-being, but it's not necessarily being used. So we probably need to consider the barriers of why it's not getting in people are not getting involved. And I think quite a lot is how it fits into the work day. What's the opportunity that exists for people to actually go and experience that? Is there a way of changing that flexibility um, in the working day, um, which I know is quite challenging in a, a lot of the areas that you guys work in, but is there a way that that could be implemented? Because we know that it will really enhance the work engagement and productivity later on. 
Could it also be that people don't know what exists? So despite the fact that there are these green spaces that are nearby, do they know that they can access them? Do they know kind of what is available to them? And I know on our university campus, we've got some lovely walks, but if I question most of my colleagues, most of them have never been kind of, um, kind of to the far side of campus. The other thing is that people might know, not know what their capabilities are and what they're able to do themselves or what they perceive they're able to do. So trying to work on that might be an idea. And of course, the big one, motivation. You know, how do we get people motivated when they're incredibly busy during a working day? How do we ensure that they feel motivated to take part? The advantage of doing things within the workspace um, you know, including what Louise is saying is that um, sometimes things aren't necessarily available at home or you're going home and it's dark. Um, so we've obviously got the opportunity within the workspace to be able to do that. But it, the work community can actually work together. So it becomes a social norm that actually going out for that five minutes is completely normal. Going to sit, you know, sit in a, in a green space or walk, putting your wellies on and going for a walk becomes, becomes the norm. So changing the culture. Um, and what we need to do is by doing that, hopefully lead to a sustained behavior change, which, watch, which is what is needed to enhance well-being. So that's the end of my presentation. Great, thank you so much, Valerie. And we're, so, we're really lucky to have had um, Valerie with such a, a kind of wealth of experience in this area working with us on this project. So thank you so much, Valerie. Um, and also able to help us to structure the questions that we're asking um, in this piece of work. Uh, great. So finally, in this section, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Kerry Newson. So she's uh, the Green Space Lead um, at the Centre for Sustainable Health Care, and she led on this work. Um, Kerry will give us some highlights of the research and importantly, some recommendations. Thank you, Kerry. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I'm Kerry Newson and um, I work on the green space side of things at, at the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. And we, what, we were really interested to do this piece of work. Um, I mean, as it's already been really touched on, uh, staff wellbeing is a huge issue for the NHS. And we know that in 2019, more than four out of 10 staff had experienced work related stress in the previous year. So, so really crucial. And at the same time, we've got this growing evidence base that really shows the importance of spending time in green environments and its role in, uh, in all sorts of beneficial ways related to well-being and reducing stress and reducing fatigue and anxiety and depression. So the question then arises, well, a lot of NHS sites do have a lot of green space. And could that be beneficial in helping to combat staff stress and helping to promote staff well-being? And at the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, that's an issue that we've been interested in for a long time because we've been working for over a decade um, with a whole network of health sites, which you'll hear a bit more about later, that are really interested in developing their green space for the sake of both their patients, but also the wider community and their staff. So in 2019, we were really pleased to get um, funding from the Health Foundation to carry out a year long research project um, which really investigated this question. And to do that, we focused on three sites that had all really encouraged their staff to spend time in green space at work. So first of all, um, Broomfield Hospital, it was great, by the way, that we had these very different sites because it meant we could look at these different contexts. Um, so Broomfield Hospital was a, uh, the largest hospital in, in our study. And this is an acute district hospital on the edge of Chelmsford. They've got 5,000 staff, so really big. They've got absolutely lovely grounds with woodlands, lawns, gardens. They're, they're exceptionally lucky and they're beautifully maintained. Um, and they have an initiative there called the Natural Health Service, where they uh, work with, they, they bring volunteers onto the site in order to uh, work on the grounds and learn horticultural skills. And that includes uh, many staff working as volunteers. They've also created a well-being terrace for staff, which has um, planters and it creates a really nice area um, for having a break. Then we work with Guild Lodge as well, which is a secure mental health care hospital um, up in, uh, in Preston. 
and they've got this fabulous grow your own project which actually grows food that is used in hospital kitchens and it has provided a great opportunity for staff to to get out outside and volunteer they've also got a, a site-wide competition that gets people involved in improving their walled gardens um, both staff and service users working together and they've made a lot of effort to create a, a sort of informal um, workspace walking culture which means that staff feel that they're able to get out and, and take walks around the site either on their own or, or with other people during working hours as time allows and we worked as well with Mount Vernon Cancer Centre um, in West London which is um, it's a specialist cancer centre with 500 staff and it used to be a TB hospital and it still has these fabulous sanatorium buildings looking over a, a huge green and there they piloted lunchtime activities for staff, such as a walking group in Kijong. And they've also um, done a lot of work to improve the, the uh, state of the grounds as well for staff. So we began by doing interviews um, with staff. We had a sort of qualitative phase of the research. And the idea was that we talked, uh, we asked the green space leads there to, um, to uh, find for us people who did and people who did not spend time in green space regularly in similar kinds of numbers. And so, for instance, on the one hand, we would be talking to a clinical scientist who, um, who generally ran or walked to work on a green route um, and, you know, would walk around the site two or three times in the summer. And then at the other extreme, um, I remember talking to a nurse consultant who said she spent her 10 hour day in a treatment room, there were no windows, and um, when she went for a break, it was also to a windowless staff room. She said, you wouldn't know if it was night or day or what season it was at all down there. So in terms of how staff said they spent time in green space at work, um, there are all sorts of ways they described to us from just enjoying the view out of a window to sometimes even having, having meetings outdoors. But it was very noticeable that the main way, the most consistent way in which they spent time um, in green space at work was taking walks around the site. And that really just emerged as very important. Um, so for example, there were a lot of staff who said they would eat lunch at their desk, but then head out and, and have a quick walk around, around the site. And um, one interviewee, for instance, said, I have a sort of lap that I do. And that was quite common, the idea that there's a walking circuit. We also found people um, talked quite a bit about walking in the course of work and the idea that even if you might not um, walk for a break, that when you were just um, on an errand around the site, you would choose the scenic route and you uh, decide to make the most of being outdoors and get the benefit of that. So it does point to the idea that if you want to encourage staff to spend time in green space, then thinking about incidental walking is quite important. It's something you can build on. And in fact, um, as I've mentioned, that's something that some of the sites have been successful in doing. We looked at the benefits that staff perceived from spending time in green space at work. Um, and with that, the main one that people talked about was simply that it was relaxing and calming. And that was true both for people who did spend time in green space at work and those who didn't. Um, but it was very noticeable that those who did spend time in green space at work would, would talk in this quite visceral way about oh, it's lovely, you're breathing fresh air, you've got a sense of space and you're, you're breathing freely. And so hence the name of the, of the report from the project. Um, and yeah, so this, this interviewee said, when you're outside, you're breathing differently, your body relaxes. Um, and interviewees from both groups talked about being in green space as something that made them feel happy and positive and reducing stress. And many of them said that they felt that when they got back to work, they would feel um, refreshed and re-energized and work better on getting back. Um, they also talked about the therapeutic benefits of green space for patients, um, particularly at Guild Lodge, actually, as a mental health unit. Um, and there, some of the interviewees mentioned this very interesting idea, I think, that Green, being in green space had a way of changing the power relations between staff and service users in a way that was really positive. Um, so this occupational therapist said, it kind of takes a bit of that clinical edge away. So an idea of that restructuring of the environment making a difference. It was also um, at other hospitals, they mentioned that they thought it was helpful as a place to have more sensitive conversations with patients, um, particularly if you're giving news or, or talking about anxiety. Um, but also that it was a good place to have conversations with colleagues. 
Um, and one of the interviewees said, we use the walkie about us and as opportunities to resolve things and iron out the creases, which I thought was a, a really nice way of putting it. We looked as well at the barriers to spending time in green space. And, and here we had a kind of framework that emerged and we've called it the seven Ps because curiously all of these barriers began with a P. Um, and the main one, perhaps not surprisingly, was pressure of work. Um, but then what we found was that that really um, interacted, with, interacted with all sorts of other uh, pressures as well, other, other issues as well. And proximity of green space was absolutely critical. Um, we found that you know, staff who are working in wards and theatres really often felt that they needed to be close by in case there was an emergency. Um, and this interviewee said, as you go off on a break, you say, come and get me if you need me. So we do try and stay handy. And some people talked about situations where it had been great because they could access green space really easily from their office, um, just stepping out onto a garden or terrace or something of that sort. Uh, privacy and protection from patients was also particularly important for clinical staff. Uh, and they were concerned about the idea that um, they might not be able to get a break if they were approached by patients and they would then not feel that they could obviously turn them away. And there were also concerns that um, if they were out in outdoor space um, with other staff, there might be a risk of compromising patient confidentiality. And some staff felt that um, it really to spend time in green space, they needed to have dedicated staff only areas that that was the only way it could work. Some staff also felt that they could feel they could be quite exposed if they were in overlooked areas and that they might actually be at risk of being criticised by patients if, if people saw them relaxing. So these, I think, are all really important considerations if you're trying to work out um, what a, a new green space should be like and, and where it should be. Permission, which I think I noticed was mentioned on, on the chat earlier. Yes, that also um, emerged as a really important issue. And um, some interviewees described that, that how they felt a very positive ethos around workplace walking, and that meant that they could go for a walk as they needed to. But at the same time, there were some who just felt this wasn't possible. Um, a member of theatre staff, for instance, who said she loved her job, but with no natural light, her workspace felt a bit like a prison. And there were rules against going outside in scrubs, which meant that she really couldn't uh, spend time in green space. And she wanted management to clarify whether this was something that would be acceptable if she was wearing a, a protective plastic gown. So we then took those findings and um, asked questions uh, at a much larger scale across the whole site uh, to see how, how, how those uh, our findings scaled up. And from that, we found um, from the three sites that there was a really strong appetite from staff for spending time in green space during the working day. 83 to 89%, depending on the site, said they'd like to spend more time in green space at work. We found a sizable proportion of staff said that the availability of attractive garden areas and green spaces was important to them in considering where to work, really suggesting that this could have a role in recruitment and retention, um, an area which, which uh, Louise was referring to. And staff who regularly spent time in the site's green spaces at work also reported significantly higher levels of well-being. And moreover, the more ways in which staff reported spending time in green space at work, the higher was their, were their well-being levels. All of the sites, um, had, had all of the sites, the most common way of spending time in green space at work was walking around the site. Again, really showing the importance of promoting informal self-guided walking. And uh, walking in the course of work was also, also common um, as we'd found in the, uh, in the interviews. Taking part in organized recreational activities was much less common, but there was an indication that those staff who did that had slightly higher well-being scores, albeit um, a marginally significant difference, but suggesting that there could be associated benefits from that. Um, we found that people who have face-to-face -face contact with patients were less likely to spend time in green space, um, but that also, interestingly, that people who have face-to-face -face contact with patients also have higher well-being levels than those who don't. Um, and from that, you can conclude that perhaps spending time with patients and spending time in green space, you know, albeit in, in situations where that's clinically um, advisable, is likely to be linked with a, with a double benefit for staff. 
So from this, we, we put together some recommendations for good practice. The first of all, important to choose locations for green space that are, are really accessible for staff near wards and offices um, and eating and rest areas to make it easy to get to. But it's important to provide comfortable seating areas with shade and places where small groups can sit together. Staff felt that the facilities on offer were very important. Um, that we need to address uh, staff concerns about privacy, that we, that might mean thinking about screening or maybe um, dedicated staff areas as well. Uh, that it's important to um, encourage staff to take patients into green space where they can, that, that that could be good for both patients and for staff. That it would be valuable to create uh, green walking routes and circuits around the site so that, so that staff can do that lap around the site and, and have a really nice in, environment while they're doing that. That it's very important to uh, build positive support for workspace walking to give people a sense that they have permission to walk. That it's valuable to provide guidance on clinical clothing outdoors and if, if it turns out that um, staff do need to change, that they can't just sort of put on a, a sort of uh, an overall of some sort, then uh, we need to think about providing the time for people to change um, actually within their working time rather than it eating into their break time. And overall, um, that effective strategies for encouraging people to spend time in green space are going to focus both on the physical infrastructure that you provide, but also on the workplace culture, um, on management support for getting into green space. And, and that, of course, is also demonstrated through outdoor facilities um, and the provision of outdoor activities. So, yes, do please have a look at the reports. They're on the website. Um, these are the links to them and they'll also be going in the chat. And thanks very much. Thank you very much, Carrie. Well, I know it's really hard to summarise um, a whole year's work in 15 minutes, so you've done a great job. And I've seen all the hard collaborative work that's gone into finding the right questions, engaging with staff, meticulous transcriptions, and all the co-creation of materials that you and the, the rest of the team have done. So well done. Um, and I'd like to encourage everyone to have a look at this report. The summary itself is um, not as long as the report and it's very rich and, and manageable. So do have a look at that. Great. So now if I ask um, both Valerie and Louise to put their cameras back on, please. And we've got 10 minutes for questions from people. And there was a question I saw early on, which is kind of fundamental, I think, which is um, how can we encourage, incentivize NHS staff currently working from home to make sure they get outside in the daylight hours during winter? So should we start with that one? Louise, go for it. Hi, thanks, Rachel. Um, and I think that's a really important question because we're all working in such different ways at the moment. Um, one of the things that we're doing, um, so I'm, I'm working from my spare room at the moment at home, um, and most of my colleagues are as well at NHS E and I. Um, and one of the things that we're enc actively encouraging and repeatedly kind of giving the messages uh, is a explicitly encouraging people to do so. But one of the things that I did yesterday is I did a fir my first walking one to one with a member of my team. Um, and actually, we um, I walked for about half an hour with this person. Uh, normally we do it, we normally do an hour, but so we were trying it and squeezing it in between bits and pieces. But uh, I think that's definitely one of the things that um, that I'll be continuing doing with that. And certainly, you know, obviously it's getting colder and wetter now, so that's a, so you need a bit more of a nudge, I think. So so we've kind of wrapped up scarf, umbrella, out we went, earphones, the works. Um, I've also done one to ones in kind of green spaces in gardens and that sort of thing in the past with with members of staff. Um, and one of the other things that uh, we're kind of encouraging colleagues to do is um, also consider if, if it's a pos at all possible, and I recognise that it isn't for everybody, but if you can shift your working pattern even so that during the middle of the day, you're able to get outside when the sun is brighter well, as the days are getting darker, um, rather than necessarily squeezing all of your work day together. Um, so maybe sort of splitting your day, starting a bit earlier, finishing for a, a longer break in the middle and finishing a bit later or, or however that works. It's exploring those sorts of things and getting creative, I think, and explicitly, repeatedly encouraging. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Well, we'll come back to you maybe on what the system itself might be able to do, but um, Andrea, do you want to 
Do you want to just pick out a question from the yeah. audience? Um, we had a question that was kind of related to that. They wanted to know if you think um, this kind of idea of a time for a, like a lunch hour has been lost, and if so, why? Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to have a go? Yes, um, I'll I'll start kick kick off on there. I think it is the the pressures of of work. Um, obviously, if you're in a NHS setting and you're kind of working on the wards, it's it's kind of you're governed by those things. But I think for the other people who work in in offices, I think we're just continually connected to our devices. So even if we try and take a break, there's just this urgency to always respond to the the, the email. You know they're the people who do much better is when they respond to emails at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. But it, for most people, that just doesn't work. So we're just having to constantly respond. So trying to take time off. And I think somebody else wrote in the, in the chat was about they felt like it was almost like permission to be given time off and that, that otherwise people thought you were slacking. So obviously, when you're walk, working at home, you're a bit more in charge of what you're doing. But that's even more complicated because there's lots of that homework thing just blends in to completely into one and I think it's it's even more challenging now so has the lunch hour been lost I think in a lot of places it has and I think we need to think about how we can get that the breaks back because we know that and I think there was a bit of work done and I, I don't know what it was based on but they basically said that if you took a break you were more you were going to gain 20 minutes back in terms of your productivity. And we probably can all appreciate that, that we, we do have this slump. And we know that because that happens physiologically as well as um, mentally, there's lots of things that explain that slump. So actually by resetting ourselves is would be really beneficial. And as I say, it could only be just five minutes. And particularly if that five minutes involves a bit of physical activity plus nature, you're gonna get a boost. Um, and that's really gonna enhance people. But people are scared of taking it um, maybe because of what other people perceive or because they feel of these pressures. And I think that was part of the, the P's that, that Kerry was explaining um, in her in, a, in the report. Kerry, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, one of the things that we looked at is what people wanted from a lunch hour, or well, not, not a lunch hour, because of course, in, in many cases, it's not, it's, it's a lunch break rather than lunch hour, it's only half an hour tops, you know. Um, but and many people found it difficult to get a break at all as well that was that was very clear but when we did talk to people about what they actually wanted from a lunch break it was interesting how many of them in in relation to what you're saying Valerie about this question of being constantly connected it was interesting how many of them were saying well actually it's it's time by myself it's not time even to spend time with colleagues or um or anything of that sort that it, it was just time out really and, and I wonder if that is very much a, a reaction to that culture where we're, we're constantly um, connected, either connected to other people through communication, electronic communication, or, or even just sort of connected to the screen, really. Okay, Andy, uh, now one more question. Um, sure, um, for Carrie, um, what tool did you use to measure staff and wellbeing scores in your research? Um, we use the uh, Edinburgh Warwick uh, um, Wellbeing Scale, and we did that uh, as part of the um, survey. So the, a part of the survey was asking questions that that allow you to um, get a, a sort of yeah score for wellbeing. And and um, uh, Kerry, can you just briefly say about numbers? Because I know that you know you. I know it's all in the in the summary and I would urge people to go and have a look at that, but just summarise very quickly the, the numbers that we got responding to things. Um, I mean, we had so, so the interviews, we interviewed 34 people, so that was quite concentrated. But then when it came to the uh, site numbers, it was I mean, it was, I think, around a thousand people overall that responded to the surveys. Mm. Um, and there were there was a good number at each site, I mean, particularly at I think at Mount Vernon, around half of the people at that site responded to the survey, um, which is very good. Um, yeah. And yeah, generally the numbers were good. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Um, so someone does want to know, how do you ensure that these types of spaces on NHS sites can be wildlife friendly as well? 
So an example given was, uh, you know, not mowing the grass so short that wildlife won't enjoy it. Um, how do you keep that balance? So um, I'll go there. I noticed there's a few conversations here about environment and environmental groups, et cetera, that have, have kind of wanting to work with NHS groups. So some of the research that we've done has definitely shown that biodiversity, and we're, we're in the middle of a PhD student who's working on this at the moment, looking at biodiversity and how that enhances well-being. And we know that increasing the biodiversity does seem to be start does seem to be um, having a, a positive effect. So yes absolutely we do need to create different spaces and different types of environment that allow that to happen so if you were in a public park you might want to have some mown grass spaces that encourages people to play that um to play football or whatever but in other places we know that kind of having kind of winding paths rather than straightforward paths particularly for workplaces where they're not necessarily rushing from a to b they're trying to just take time out that kind of magic and mystery that happens with kind of increased biodiversity also enhances well-being so absolutely and it sounds like there's some groups out there that would might help with enhancing those spaces in nhs settings which would be brilliant because that would help with kind of maybe volunteering aspect of it not necessarily just from the nh staff and i know there were some people who were doing some volunteering work weren't there i think in in our um in our study but it would also maybe bring other people in that that could access the site that could be volunteering on those big big sites as well providing kind of a community resource as well so i think there's a huge range of benefit that we could get by Kind of enhancing biodiversity in these spaces but they need to be planned but i can see there's loads of expertise on the chat from from various different people um that could help with that yeah no and carrie do you want to say anything briefly about oh, that and sarah's going to be talking a bit later about um the nhs forest uh, which is a um a support network that that is there to really encourage people to um, really maximise the the use of their sites, but including its its biodiversity potential, um, in you know including growing more woods, but uh, more more trees, but also including looking at other sorts of um, ecological issues, or you know whether you might might want to you know have areas of um, species rich grassland that kind of thing. And I also we, know we've got um, Richard Hughes from Broomfield coming on later, who is who works at Broomfield and um, we'll talk about uh, some of the possibilities there uh, that they've had in terms of developing con developing the site for conservation as well as for recreation. Brilliant and it's been really really encouraging over the last well especially over the last five years I think just to see how many sites have you know stopped um, sort of outsourcing um, their green spaces to contract mowers basically and have started really thinking creatively about about their sites. Somebody's asked a question about funding for this kind of work, uh, inevitable. Um, so maybe that's a good point uh, at which to get, because I could say a little bit about that, maybe if you've got time later, but Louise, um, if this is good for staff and if this is good for um, productivity, is there any chance of, or what, I suppose, not is there any chance, but what could we do? What's the most powerful thing that we could do to kind of, um, I don't know, put something in strategically that would help to pull this through the, the system and embed it really in, in mainstream. Yeah, I mean, I think um, obviously, you know, the, the work that um, you and Carrie and, and the team have all done um, makes the case for it, doesn't it? Um, I guess I, what I would be really keen to hear from our, um, our participants today actually is what, what do they need from us as a national team to help enable them to do that? because I think I'm really conscious that quite often, you know, we might be thinking down one route and everyone kind of goes, why have you done that? You know, it'd be really helpful to know from everybody, actually what would make making that case easier for you? Um, because I can then take back, all, I'll, I'll copy and paste all the comments um, and, and take that back to the team as well. Um, so actually I, I'd quite like to put that question out to the group that's joined us this morning. Okay, brilliant. Well batted back. <laughs> Anyway, well, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the big, one of the big questions anyway. And, and I think, you know, other people have asked about research, we're kind of nudging towards narrowing down, aren't we, what people want and what's, what's going to work. And so it does feel, it does feel really positive. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, 
we we're going to see a video now um then um we'll look forward to hearing from people at all of the three sites that you'll see in the video and you can ask them some questions so as you're watching do stand up and stretch if you can um and write questions for the sites in the chat so that we'll be able to ask them when we come back Hello, I'm Sarah, I'm a cardiology research nurse. And I'm Natalie, one of the burns and plastics research nurses. And we're standing in the grounds of Broomfield Hospital. And this is where we come for our walk most lunch times. We like to come here as and when we can to just to refresh our heads in between patients and just at lunchtime for a quick 10 minute walk. Hello, my name is Richard Hughes. I'm in charge of grounds and gardens here at Broomfield Hospital. You can see behind me the sunken garden, which was originally a pond, uh, which was part of the Edwardian house, and the owner of the house had the, the pond built. At the same time, she, built, she planted all these trees, which have got TPO orders on them. So the, pond, the sunken garden dates back a long, long time. A couple of years ago, we actually got a grant from Tesco's for £8,000, and we created the sunken garden as it is now. So we're standing here in the sunken garden now and it's a really beautiful place to sit. Um, I've often seen patients and their families when they're here to visit sat um, in the garden um, and it's a beautiful view out of the windows of the offices. So we're really fortunate here at Brimville to have all this space which is really like a park in the summer. We've had meetings out here, lunches and it's just a really nice safe place to come in, sit and reflect and improve your mental health where you can. My name's Joanne Smith and I'm the Health and Wellbeing Strategic Lead for Lancashire and South Cumbria Foundation Trust. I'm here today at Guild Lodge as part of the NHS Forest Project. I am passionate about the prevention of ill health. Uh, my background is public health and it's so important that we look after our staff. So the, the jobs that people do here are quite challenging so it's been fantastic for them to understand the benefits of having green space, flowers, wildlife, all around the place. We would say really Guild is wrapped in natural beauty and it gives everybody here a lovely space to breathe when they can get out and enjoy the fresh air. We're going to go down to the allotment site in a moment and talk to some people that work there um, and have been involved. So can you tell us what it is you like about being here? Um, I've just been on that leave and I've just come back and the green space is amazing. It's great for well-being, it's great for yourself, it, if you just get carried away you're all day, it's great, the space is brilliant. It was fantastic because we have been working from home to just get away from the laptop, come out into the fresh air. It's coming down here, it's just the, the stresses seem to melt away for the day, especially with the situation at the moment. It's an area where you can come away from the sounds and stresses of everyday life. You can hear the birds singing, uh, you often see all sorts of wildlife. So I'm really conscious of my own uh, mental health and I just call this my happy place. It's um, really apparent now, especially due, during lockdown, how um, open spaces really um, help you terms of mental well-being. What I like about here is the fact that we've been given this plot of land which you can see here with which we as a community we can use and uh, grow our own food. Uh, I really enjoy coming here it gives me a lot of mental well-being and enjoyment. Being down here for me is a time out not just from the portrait but from other things that's going on around all the time and the benefits of um, horticulture and green space in um, lifting your spirits, lifting your mood and promoting mental health. Um, excited about the work that we've been doing around green space. We, you know, we are very privileged to have a beautiful um, environment at Guild Lodge. And it's good for mental health because you get out and there's the art green and things. You plant loads of trees and for, for me, from a personal point of view, it's been fantastic this year to see all the benefit that staff have, have got got from from the project. Um, especially with the biggest barrier being the the COVID nineteen. And 
hope this video clip has shown you how passionate we are about the green space that we've got here at Guild. You've heard from staff, service users, you've seen the space that we've got here. We really do have a positive culture around how green array and green space supports our well-being. Thank you. I'm Ginny Abubaka and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Mount Vernon Cancer Centre, a specialist cancer centre in Middlesex. We employ in the region of 500 staff. The hospital itself was originally built as a TB sanatorium. Its elevated site, just outside London, was chosen and designed to offer fresh air treatment for its patients. The clock tower has been a recognisable symbol for the centre for a long time and this lawned area is well known and well loved by staff. Many long-serving members of staff remember open days and social events being held here. In warmer weather, this area is well used for staff lunch breaks with much of the existing seating and lawn area well used. Some staff also take the opportunity to use this route rather than walking through the hospital during the course of their working day. Following extensive engagement with staff, an idea to establish a circular green walking route consistently emerged as a priority. Organised group lunchtime walks that circled the whole site received negative feedback from staff, too much concrete and too many car parks. This area therefore presents an ideal location. We have an exciting opportunity to create a woodland walkway by making a mown path around the main lawn with some meadow planting to enhance the route and clearing a marked path through woodland around the edge. The scheme includes signage and new and refurbished seating. Whilst the motivation for this project is staff health and wellbeing, there is of course an important opportunity to improve the patient's experience at the centre too. The plans have received overwhelmingly positive feedback from both patients and staff and we are eager to realise the potential. The work with CSH over the last 12 months has really helped to inform how we can implement the project most effectively. It's been interesting to learn how the history of the site resonates and how we might use this to engage people with the space, for example. And it's been particularly helpful to learn from the experiences of the other two sites involved. We hope to emulate some of their successes by creating an organisational culture where accessing the outdoor space and walking during the working day do become part of staff's daily activity at work. So, um, if we could ask all the people who are from the sites to put their videos on and then Andy if you can find us some nice questions so I hope you enjoyed seeing that short video um, we're very lucky to have staff from all three sites here today um, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves when they answer a question rather than going around everybody um, but Andy have you got any questions um we've just we've had a question come in about um people want to know some advice for sites that have little green space so with your experience um how can sites with small green spaces also encourage staff use of natural areas okay any of you like to answer that one yes i can answer that oops okay richard Is go that... for it okay I'm assuming that they've got probably concrete and tarmac, and you can always fence off an area, provide planters and seating, because really what we're all trying to do at these hospital sites is a task called placemaking. And basically you want four criteria that you've got to meet. One is accessibility, which unfortunately at Broomfield, we have real problems with accessibility. Some of the courtyards you can't even get into because you have to go through the wards to actually go into them. Um, and then you've got comfort, which includes security, seating, but that seating has to be movable. And quite often if you've got fixed seating, people can't form the groups that they want to form. And then after that, you've got, is it sociable? And obviously it wants to be a place you want to go to. You want to recommend your friends to go there. You want to have meetings there and all those sorts of things. So, you know, even the smallest spaces. And if you can think of some of the urban spaces that have been made into places that people want to go to, you've got a lot of potential. You don't have to have vast areas of green space. It's just, you know, getting people to engage with it. And it always helps if you can speak to the users before you create these these places great so Thank right you. from the beginning they will engage in it 
Excellent. So ask people what they want and yes. make it flexible. Ginny, yeah. did you, you had something to, to add, did you? Yes, I'm just, um, I'm Ginny Abubakar, Community Engagement Manager at Mount Vernon Cancer Centre. But when we first started looking at the possibility of using green space for health and well-being, I remember being taken around, um, not our hospital, but Hillingdon Hospital um, with a project lead. Um, and in the meeting, they were saying, well, we don't have any green space to, to use. And we then went on a walk through the hospital and we suddenly realised spaces that we hadn't really acknowledged before. So, you know, the, the same things, you know, corridors that overlooked um, patches of, of, of really beautiful green space that always had some element of interest to them. Great, thank you. Um, and, and I absolutely, that view of the green space can sometimes be as powerful as, as being in it if you can't actually get out into it, it's really important. Um, Andy, another question? Yeah, so we've had a comment from a clinician that he's encountered a number of barriers in trying to start his own project. Um, so some health and safety issues, but um, also from managers not wanting to have, um, you know, to have problems with maintaining these spaces. Do you have any advice on that? Okay, great. Adi, go for it. Yeah, um, I'm a medical secretary. I'm not a lead for well-being. I'm not a site lead, um, but myself and colleagues have got together. We've become a friends group for the um, site, uh, Guild Lodge, and you just have to be persistent. You have to keep asking who is responsible for this, who is responsible for that. Um, and you have to keep on, just keep on going with it. Um, small steps, we've looked at different ways that we can improve our, our green spaces, whether that is building planters, whether that is um, asking that the, the grass isn't mown as much or as short. Um, it's a it's a slog, but it, it's worth it. And and as you can see from Guild Lodge, we are getting the results. Um, it don't be the only person doing it would be my advice. Excellent, really good tips. So keep going, find a group to work with. Um, don't take no for an answer. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, one more question, I think. Um, we've had a comment um, that they're loving this holistic approach to, you know, engaging staff in green space. How do you inspire doctors and other clinicians to get involved and um, how many do you need for this to be successful? So the importance of engaging with clinical staff specifically. To encourage clinical staff to use green space, how do you encourage, how do you inspire them to kind of be part of the movement and for this to create kind of a, a culture change in work in their workplace? How how many um, how many do you need? What's the tipping point? <laughs> yes. Okay. Hi, it's Joe Smith. Am I okay to come in on that one? Yeah, definitely. Go for it, Joe. I, th I think it's just about patience, you know, pardon the pun, but from small acorns, big trees can grow. Um, what we've done at Guild Lodge is we've had a consistent approach to well-being, and, and that's just been bringing along people, um, drip feeding the messages. And a little bit like uh, uh, Ali said, once people get out and about, I know sometimes it's hard to encourage in the first instance, but as soon as people feel the benefits, then you've got word of mouth, you've got people talking about what's going on and sharing stories. So it is that sort of creating the, the conversations, if you like, and people talking about their experiences and doing it. Um, you know, it, it's no point as, as, as saying how fantastic all these things are. We have to find the time, be it a short time, to get out there and, and do what we say we're doing. Um, but, you know, just keep persevering because um, people feel the benefit and understand it and start sharing their, their experiences. Great, thank you, Joe. So your critical mass is one, basically. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of what they call large scale change and culture change. So I think if you can get one and you can reframe the story for others, you just keep reframing and experiencing and, and explaining and it will grow. Um, it just takes a little bit of patience. Thank you. 
Nicole, do you like to yeah, say? I was just going to um, echo what Joanne's just said there. It's um, And just picking up on the, the term culture change, this takes time and I don't think there's one single factor that, that you can really focus on. There's so many factors involved from really the influence of those um, key participants in the organisation that can generate the, the change and, and the kind of encouragement towards their colleagues to follow suit and, and get out and get involved in the green spaces. Um, and, and also things like that, that can incentivize people out, you know, from being a health and wellbeing lead, I'm thinking about walking challenges and, and what um, uh, the earlier speaker said about the walk challenge, there was a purpose for them to get out rather than, there is that nature that people go out for walks at times. I often think that's when they really desperately need it rather than, um, you know, unless they're in that kind of wellbeing space, they, they do it anyway but incentivizing them out. And that might just be the starting step for them to create a bit of a habit that, that follows suit thereafter. But there's just so many factors. It is about patience, it's about trying things. And I don't think there'll always be a direct line to, towards increasing it. There may be a few you know, ups and downs in the, the process, but it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. Great. Oh, and Re Rebecca, I know we can't see you, but do, did you want to come in and say anything? Not yeah, sure. um, so I'm Rebecca McDonald, the lead dietitian at Mount Vernon. Um, I suppose Ginny's done a lot of really great work in terms of including the clinicians on the health and well-being um, discussions and groups, which is really important to have representatives from each area that can really go out then to their own teams and sort of like spread the encouragement. And all it really takes is one of your colleagues to say, you know, come out for a walk with me or let's go out at lunch. And you say, oh, I don't really have enough time. And they go, oh, come on, you can manage 10 minutes. Um, and then it, yeah, spreads from there. It's so important. And I really value just having even meetings and things outside, you know, so you don't need a huge space, just somewhere to sit and um, a coat at the minute. Um, but yeah, yeah, um, it doesn't take a lot to start getting others involved. Thank you very much. Um, well, that's it's really. I'm sorry we haven't got longer because we could we could discuss this for hours. <laughs> um, but thank you all very very much for um, for taking part not in the research but also for coming on today. It's really good to see you all so involved in all of this work carrying on. So thank you very much. Um, and then just for our last uh, session, I'd um, I'd like to welcome Sarah Dandy. So Sarah Dandy has. Um, really led all the NHS forest work right from the beginning at the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. Um, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the NHS forest and how we can help you in greening NHS sites. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Rachel, for the introduction. Um, so I'm just really going to very briefly talk about what the NHS forest does. Um, and for those of you that are interested in joining, um, do sign up. So we have um, over 200 NHS forest sites as part of our network, some of which have planted a tree and demonstrated their commitment to sustainability, and others have um, done some really, really detailed um, community engagement on their sites. Um, you've heard from three of our NHS forest sites already, um, and I'll be showing you some pictures of, of what some of others been done in a bit. So, our network includes um, green space professionals and um, people from estates teams and also healthcare professionals as well. Uh, we have plenty of networking opportunities. Uh, we run an annual conference um, which features a workshop with examples of best practice um, from existing sites. So plenty of opportunities to kind of learn from what people have done already to discuss um, challenges and how to overcome them. Um, we tend to have a theme that we run each year as well, which um, obviously the workplace wellbeing evaluation research you've heard about today has um, stemmed from that. And we very much listen to our sites and, and what's relevant and, and sort of key issues that are, that are current. Um, we have a newsletter, which um, you can sign up to via the NHS Forest website. And that provides um, sort of regular ideas and experiences, again, one of the sort of major things that I think a lot of people have benefited from over the last 10 years has been um, examples of, of what people have done already and getting ideas. And I should also say for anyone thinking of developing their green space, um, start small and, and get and get bigger. 
over um, a number of years rather than sort of going in trying to develop something too complicated from day one. Um, and our NHS Forest group also, we have, um, we try and link in with national events through the year, including NHS sustainability. So how can um, the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare help? We, we um, can provide online or phone support. Um, so do get in touch with us. We have um, a number of um, projects that have um, developed over the years, which we've managed directly. So that can, can, can include designing the space, um, bringing in delivery partners, working on promotional activities, and also working with staff and patients and making sure as many people um, use the green space as possible. And for those of sites that are struggling to work out how they can fund it, we can also um, suggest funding sources as well. And every year we have um, our tree sponsorship scheme. You can sponsor a tree via the NHS Forest website. Um, and that over the last couple of years, we've had really unprecedented sponsorship. We've had sponsorship from individual people, but also from um, companies such as the Great Outdoor Gym Company and the search engine Ecosia has also generously sponsored some trees this year, which has meant that we've um, got a number of sites throughout the UK that are busy planting trees. So again, do let us know if you are keen to receive any of those for the next year or so. Um, for those sites that are thinking, hold on a second, how do we even start? We've also got a design guidance, which we've developed um, in conjunction with the landscape architect, which gives plenty of ideas for developing green space. And we can also provide links to existing sites um, who can share what they've done and, and sort of give ideas as to how to move forward. And that's it for me today. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, right, well, gosh, well, that was, um, we, we've actually got a tiny bit of, uh, tiny bit of extra time. So if there are more questions, we can have a few more. I don't want to, um, I don't want to take time kind of wrapping up until we have to. So let me have a look, or Andy, you can have a look for me. Um, um, yes, we did have a question about, um, so from a retired GP and he wants to know, how can you develop a project at a hospital site when you're out of the system as he's retired? So how can you help when you're not in the NHS anymore? Okay, great question. So um, I would say that there are, usually uh, volunteer groups um, attached to sites. So you can definitely find out if there's a, a volunteer group at your, um, at wherever you want to get attached to. Anybody else from sites want to mention other ways of getting involved? There's, you can fundraise. Um, I know that, I know that I've worked um, with a few sites who've had very, very good volunteer groups. Um, so that's probably the best way if people don't have other options. Okay. Um, um, now, I, there was... There was some... You're right, volunteers, absolutely. Is that, that most trusts have some kind of volunteering team, um, which is probably a good route to, to get into. And I'm sure everybody would welcome an extra pair of hands to help with that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, one more, one more thing. Back to the research, um, Kerry. I know that uh, the research talked quite a lot about the supportive culture and how you know making it possible to staff um, for staff to get more out and incentivizing, giving permission, basically. Um, what do you think from having talked to so many people? What do you think were the key things in creating that? Um. I, I think it's, I mean, it's obviously partly about where there's a will, there's a way, isn't it? That if people feel that they're, that this is something that is taken seriously, then that's, you know, that's the, um, the minimum that you've got to have in order for people have to have a sense of permission. Um, but at the same time, there, you know, there is, an, it's quite a deep issue. And I, I, you know, I'm interested to know what Louise thinks about this as well, because I, because there were people in the research who just said, yeah, fine, but it's not realistic. You know, it's not realistic for me, um, particularly in, in clinical situations. Um, 
and that there were some people who felt that they really had tried you know senior people who tried to encourage that possibility but but said that you know well it, it is really quite difficult to get that culture change and part of it was about I think part of it um, was even about there being a, a sort of culture a, a sort of culture of heroism that precluded it you know and, and I don't know if that's something that Louise would want to comment on or, I know Nicole also mentioned it to me the other day okay thanks Kerry yeah, I, I think you're quite right, Kerry. I think um, we are in the habit of putting everybody else before us, and that includes sort of rest breaks and getting out into spaces and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, we heard earlier about how, um, you know, if you're in a clinical area, then there's always somebody else to see or, or, or you know, another patient to, to help or something that needs doing. There is always something there, and I guess, um, creating that environment you know as colleagues where you can go actually don't worry I, I can look after your patients or or you know that kind of sharing um it, it's it's those sort of small acts that make it quite a big difference and similarly if you're not working in a clinical area if you're working maybe in an office-based environment or um community environment that sort of thing giving yourself permission and so saying to somebody you know, I haven't seen you get up for however long or now that we're working from from home a lot more um you know when was the last time you took a, a break from your screen um and and the nudging and, and that sort of thing you know it's those those sorts of things start to have that cultural shift um and and you know similarly yeah we, we heard somebody else mention earlier prompting and sort of saying you know oh well shall we why don't we take this meeting for a walk or mm -hmm. um and obviously you know it's making that accessible to people who might have difficulties with that as well but um being mindful of caring for our colleagues caring for one another Mm, great thank you Louise Nicole yeah just um jumping in and, and kind of echoing what Louise said there I heard the term being used of a, a hero complex of staff where sometimes they feel um it's a good thing to work a long shift without taking a break it's almost seen as a good thing that they've gone above and beyond and I appreciate those days happen for us all sometimes where that that does take place but it shouldn't become the norm really we all know that that deteriorates our own health and ultimately affects our own well-being so it's as Louise said, it's all those little things and what we really saw through COVID was the impact of team and the support of your team and how um, crucial that really was to keeping people well. Uh, and as we said, just those small things like checking in and um, giving people a nudge. And, and I think it does come from an influence of the um, managers or just those key people within the team that really has uh, an impact on their colleagues to say, let's go for a walk and, and, and change the culture slowly. And, and it just takes one person to start that. Uh, and then it becomes a, a norm over time. But yeah, it's, it's really just addressing that. Yeah, work is busy, that's the NHS. This is not specific to COVID. Before COVID, staff are always busy, but just changing that culture over time. And it is, it, it's going in the right direction, I would say. Great, thank you. Well, Valerie, did you want to say anything for that? Yeah, I think it's it's not just about individuals. I think we're, what we need to look at is how we change the whole system and how, because there's a lot of issues around funding, etc. So to how do we get the right people speaking to each other? Because I can hear the, you know, the tensions that exist. And is there, we're, I'm doing a piece of work for Essex County Council about whole system change and physical inactivity. And it's complex and it's difficult. And it's, you know, because there's lots and lots of issues with lots of it but trying to get the right people sitting around a table discussing it and it not being kind of falling onto one person's shoulders to get it moving but how do we get it so that it becomes this this whole system approach to looking after all of the people within that hospital setting maybe the community as well I know there's some issues with safeguarding etc but how do we do that how do we map that system maybe first of all to see who's important in making things happen and rather than just kind of doing although this trickle and this nudge is important but I think if we're going to get big changes we need to have those bigger conversations and getting real key stakeholders around the table to having those discussions mm. well we'd love to help that happen um, and I, I mean many of you will have seen the net zero uh, report um, for the NHS that's come out just a couple of weeks ago and that is obviously, well, it's fo that's focused more on carbon, but it is about sustainability more generally as well. Um, and I think there are things coming from several different angles here that could actually really help to shift the system. 
So you've got the lower carbon, you've got appreciation that we're all part of the same ecosystem, you've got real um, issues around staff well-being. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know if there were, if we could just, if we could find those kind of places and levers, um, I know there's no magic bullets, but um, yeah, we need to keep working together and learning together and finding finding those ways of of shifting not just things at one place but helping to feed that back into the center i think so that we can we can kind of scale up what's what the good practice is um and that's you know that's one of the roles of the nhs forest that's one of the reasons we started it with, um, was to try and help do that nationally um and i think you know that, that there's certainly progress and um, I mean, as Valerie and many others will know, there's a lot of research has gone on in this area in the last five or six years. And I do feel that it's definitely, I think when we first, Sarah and I uh, um, applied for some research back in, research funding back in about, uh, about 10 years ago to look at the NHS forest, um, we had two quite opposite answers from people um, around the funding. One was that we didn't need to prove any of this because it was already a lot of evidence. And the other was that this was completely inappropriate for the NHS. So it's really interesting how that's shifted. Um, and there's been a recognition of, there is a lot of evidence. There's some more specific bits of research to be done to kind of narrow down what can change, what people really want, what can actually work for the system. Um, but it does really feel, it does feel like we're getting there. Um, so good, I, I should- just, I was Sorry, go on, Joe. go just, for it. I was just going to add to that. I, I think just sort of having a, been around health and well-being for a long, long time, um, it's now accelerated. Um, and I think the, the, the understanding that it isn't pink and fluffy, um, it's about sort of serious buy-in, you know, talk of we've got frameworks, we've got the people plan that now reflects all the the sort of ambitions to support people a well-being guardian is being talked about by trust so it, it really is the time to sort of springboard and see that looking after our people and providing things such as green spaces helps people well um, to keep well and be in work mm -hmm. so there's a very strong business argument for this as well as the well-being holistic um, so I think the time is now um, we've just got to keep going with it absolutely and i and i think the other so the other crucial thing is that you know some of you are within the health system some of you are, are outside it wanting to work with it on this uh, on this call and and it's really important for us to be able to try and talk together as as community as one community um, and that's really hard because you know each of those you know sectors has their own culture and their own language um, so the other thing that we need to get better at is is sharing across that boundary, because I think that will really, really kind of accelerate what can happen here. So healthcare is a mystery to people who don't work in this, is a mystery to most of us who work within it as well, but, um, and, and demystifying that and encouraging, you know, opening the doors and windows to people who are outside that can, can be really, really uh, powerful. Great. Well, thank you so much, all of you. Um, just to mention that, uh, so please do look at the report uh, itself and enjoy that in its full um, splendor. Um, and that we've got some, we've got a green green space and health um, course coming up, which uh, somebody's put in the chat. I think um, we will download the chat for people and send that round and the uh the video of the recording of this and the presentations will be available on the website so um just like to thank you all for attending today and giving us your energy and um and time and thank you especially to our our panelists and speakers thank you and um go breathe breathe well uh, and enjoy your green spaces thank you bye-bye <laughs>